Hello, um, and welcome to our short interview series about housing and community development issues and other issues that those those topics intersect with. And today we're gonna we're gonna talk to someone where that is very in the middle of how the housing affects a different area, which is education. And today our um, guest is Kate Noble, who's the president of the Santa Fe Public School Board, um, and also works for Growing Up. Um, New Mexico, which is an early childhood education initiative in Santa Fe. And my name is Mike Loft, and I'm the CEO of HomeWise and, and a, a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute. So Kate, welcome. Really Thank looking you. forward to having a conversation. Great to be here. Yeah, good. So, you know, recently, like everybody in Santa Fe has been freaked out because um, the realtors just announced that the median sales price of a home in Santa Fe County is actually now over $600,000. Um, we looked at what, what's going on there. We saw that in one year, home prices went up 30%, which I've in 30 years of doing this, I've never seen that dramatic of a price increase. So how is this affecting the schools? Well, it's part of really a multi-pronged crisis in staffing our schools. And there's a lot playing into that, the pandemic, um, fears of exposure to COVID, um, as well as burnout and exhaustion are all factors. But in Santa Fe, where, as you, as you point out, we've had an incredibly dramatic rise in prices, and, and Santa Fe hasn't been um, incredibly accessible for people to afford housing for a long, long time. HomeWise has done a lot of great work around that. But ultimately, this is just something that, with this dramatic rise, is really adding to the problem because... Educators are the bedrock of community. We need teachers in our schools. It's not just teachers, it's educational assistants, EAs, uh, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, custodians, principals, secretaries, everybody is really, you know, it turns out schools are a community building exercise. It's where people meet, they go, it's part of the routine every day, they eat together, you know, all of these yeah. things. And if we don't have people living in the community, it really starts to erode the community. And all of those human factors um, follow on very, very quickly, like, you know, how how people sort of take care of each other, whether when they know whether to call parents or not, if something's going on with a kid. Um, but ultimately, you know, we've also had a cry from our teachers union, from the ranks of our educators that are saying, you know, we can't live here, which means we might be looking for jobs elsewhere. So it's really all connected. And if we can't house teachers and educators in our community, our school systems will start eroding really quickly. Now, it's a really good point of how central schools are. It's such a central institution to communities and the well-being of communities. More, more than uh, a lot happens there, not just in the classroom, right? And uh, so they're really vital. Um, I know you, before we had the most recent announcement of the new home price levels in Santa Fe, I know you sponsored a resolution, uh, kind of a call to action um, at the school board that I think has since been adopted by the city and the county. Tell us more about that and wh why did you, what's the initiative and, and why did you take it? Well, I've been looking at this a long time, and it's something you and I have talked about a lot before about, you know, how people make an organization and the importance of, of talent and culture and, and some of these things that we're really getting our heads around more robustly, it seems, um, and the pandemic has accelerated that. But there's been an, a, a crisis in educator staffing for a very long time. And that partly, I mean, one person even said to me, it goes back to really the women's liberation movement, that an unintended consequence of saying women should be able to be chief executives and pilots and everything out there was that it was like, don't just be a teacher. And so there's been maybe this unintended sort of um, really the confidence and, and what's the word I'm looking for, um, erosion of the, you know, teaching profession and the perception of the teaching perception that it, it's just women's work, if you will. So this has been going on a long time. And then there's the pay issue. You know, we've never paid in part because of that embedded sexism. We've never paid teachers properly for the value in society. 
So you take the perceptions, you take the pay, you take all these things, and, and we haven't seen people wanting to enter the teaching profession in recent years. People look for different careers. But then you add to that the pandemic, and it's just, it's like we were on this downward slide and it just accelerated, you know, the curve accelerated extremely because of the exposure, because of the exhaustion, because of the change of modality. You know, we had to change pretty much overnight to online schooling. In any other industry, a big shift and pivot like that would be celebrated by Wall Street and everybody would be writing it up. In education, it's just expected. Of course you do this. Of course you have to do this because what is the alternative? And educators have long just rolled with, okay, now we feed, now we do health, now we do all these other things because really the people who go into education are all about the children. So I've been watching this since I've been on the board for five years and then seeing the pandemic and seeing the issues and talking with the NEA and seeing the housing prices, because there are all these other things that happen with housing prices, like people who have been renting units or maybe didn't live here in Santa Fe and they're renting their house, they decide to sell because that's a good price. Why wouldn't you sort of take the money and go on with your life? Well, that means there are lots of people who are getting pushed out of their long-term rentals and this, that, and the other. So again, everything, these compounding factors have been accelerating it. So I sponsored this resolution um, in the fall of last year and worked with colleagues at the city and the county. I don't know that we've ever passed, had three local governments passed a sort of resolution in parallel, declaring this and agreeing to work together, primarily on the housing thing, because that's where there's a lot of overlap. The city and county can help. And there's recognition that uh, city and county workers can't do their work if they don't have kids in school. So we're really in this expansive phase of seeing all the value that schools have always provided to society, but the pandemic has amplified that, has really magnified all of these things, including we don't have a workforce if we don't have schools. And um, so we're really trying to address that and the housing is, issue is just central to it. You know, it's the hierarchy of needs. And again, if we can't house people in this community, we don't have a community around our schools that supports, frankly, every other industry in this town and every other. Yeah. I mean, one, one piece of good news is that it looks like our legislature's in session right now, and it looks like they are gonna raise teacher pay like $10,000 a year, which you know would mean an entry-level teacher would go from 40,000 to 50,000. That's going to help uh, a lot. Um, not going to help a teacher in, in a Santa Fe buy a home, right? It's just fifty thousand is still like really hard given our prices. So we just like started announced with the, with you and the schools, um, you know, a down payment assistance program that we got an anonymous donation for that will provide up to to forty thousand um, dollars in down payments. So that'll that'll help overcome that barrier. How are you thinking about it? like what other kinds of things do we need to be doing on housing? Like we got this down payment program. What else? Yeah, well, uh, you know, it, it's really an all connected system and it is about pay and what you can afford and what you can afford in terms of housing while being able to afford other key things like like food and, and heat. Um, so those pay increases that our legislature is looking at really will help. Um, and there may be some unintended consequences across areas like early childhood, which I know we can talk about in a minute. Um, but this partnership with HomeWise and the down payment assistance is really important because it's, it's a specific tool in addressing the continuum of needs. So not everybody will qualify or be ready for down payment assistance and to buy a house, but some people will be. And those people are really important to retain because if you're buying a house, obviously you're, you're kind of going all in in the community. So again, to me, I think about it as a community building exercise. And, and this is a really critical part because people that own their own homes in a community are really invested. They've got roots. They will build community. We need to develop other tools to help all the way from entry level rental, um, even to transitioning from one home to another. You know, if we have people whose children have left home and they're ready to downsize, um, we need to just be able to shore to be sure that they can make those transitions. That's easier once you've been in home ownership. So, you know, concentrating on entry-level rental up the first-time home buyers is probably where the greatest need is. 
But this down payment assistance give us, gives us a really specific and targeted tool, and that is fabulous for one area of the continuum, and we need to develop other tools for other areas of the continuum. Yeah. I mean, it strikes me, too, that even with the down payment assistance, and we do a lot of home, home buyer education, all sorts of stuff, got, we do really affordable mortgages. Um, if there's not If there's not homes to buy, if there's not supply, that's just not going to you know, well, you're building not going to do the trick, right, Mike? I mean, yeah, you we, build we are. <laughs> but it seems like, I mean, but and we're really trying to step up that effort because, I mean, we've had that problem with the rental thing, and more re the last few years, Santa Fe's made some real progress on building more rental units. I think we're really lagging on the, the ownership opportunities. Um, it really seems to me we just can't get ahead of this if we don't increase housing supply. I think that's right. And, and honestly, we need comprehensive zoning reform in order to do that. We need not only, you know, we it, it, and we seem to do this, that it's like we realized that there was a crisis in rental housing. So we've worked on um, enabling rental housing in Santa Fe. And now it's interesting that you say we may be lagging on the home ownership, but that's sort of how we go. It's like, what's the most immediate problem? Let's yeah. fix that. And, and then we forget about other things and then that becomes a bigger problem. So we got to fix that. And really, we need to be more strategic about zoning reform to really figure out how we house working people in our community. Santa Fe is fortunate to be a place that lots of people love to be, who have lots of money, lots of people love to retire. But of course, there's unintended consequences. And to maintain the vitality of a community, we need to be able to house working families. That's just so important. And education is foundational to that you know teachers are often in this sort of awkward middle ground and if they get raises you know that's good but sometimes they make a little bit too much to really access the affordable housing programs that are out there and so then your point is incredibly important we've we've got to have the supply we've got to have the market meeting um the demand here and and teachers are sort of at this you know mid-level professional pay that can be a really awkward place to be but again we just we have to address that if we lose our teachers yeah. we kind of lose everything yeah yeah some people call that the missing middle right that there's these people stuck in the middle that aren't getting any help um, but we got to do that. Let's talk about um, early childhood education. You're the vice president of Growing Up New Mexico in charge of policy and stakeholder engagement. Tell us about Growing Up New Mexico and what y'all are doing on the early childhood education front. So this, I love my day job. I call growing up New Mexico my day job and the school board my night job. Um, and I love how connected they are. And early childhood, you know, from the sort of prenatal to five space for children um, is nowhere near as organized as the kindergarten to 12 space. There aren't, you know, tiers. It's not a publicly supported system the way public education is. So Growing Up New Mexico really is an amazing organization that does everything from soup to nuts. We have direct services that start prenatally, home visiting for families, and then after they have new babies. Um, we have an early education center, um, our Connie Early Learning Center, that provides up to pre-K. And then we have the area that I oversee, which is informed by all of our direct services, which is looking at the statewide systems and how we build them. Uh, two years ago in 2019, I guess that's three years ago now, we created an early childhood education and care department, cabinet level department at the state level. We were the fifth or sixth state in the nation to do this. And we have by far the most comprehensive early childhood department because it brings together early intervention, home visiting, some prenatal work, as well as pre-K um, child care and some other other pieces that support all of that. And we have an incredible secretary in Elizabeth Briginski who came out of Washington, D.C. and is nationally known. And we have been building this system aggressively and during a pandemic. But we're really looking at what does universal pre-K look like? What does universal child care and affordable child care, where we recently got a grant as the sixth state um, under a how do we transform child care to make it accessible and affordable really to everyone? Um, so there's a lot of profound work in this. And make no mistake about it, for anyone who doesn't work traditional hours for overnight shifts, for health workers, this sort of thing, child care is essential. It is as essential as public schools and arguably the best investment a society can make because there's a lot of evidence that 
good developmentally appropriate high quality programming in those early years just has an exponential uh, payoff as throughout a child's lifetime because the brain development that happens prenatal to five is sort of everything. And there's more and more evidence that if there's a lag in those first five years and kids come to kindergarten not ready for kindergarten, schools can't catch up. The K-12 system can't bridge the gap that has already occurred if there hasn't been good development in a child in the zero to five years. Yeah. So it's all it's all connected. Yeah. Well, and I think, it, you know, and, and there's general acceptance now of the, the how important um, pre-K is in early childhood development stuff. The, but it's also true that child care workers and pre-K teachers, they get paid even less than regular public school teachers, right? What, you know, so their housing challenges and just life challenges have to be even, even more severe than what we're facing with teachers. Is that? It's extreme. It is unbelievable. And honestly, we're struggling, even in those of us that are working on this, a little bit with what I would call is almost a poverty mentality that people are like, well, we need to pay $18 an hour. It's like, no, we don't. We need to pay way more. Can't we pay early childhood workers like lawyers because they have a greater value to society? And honestly, maybe this is a little bit radical, but I see this as sort of the ultimate end of sexism and racism that have been embedded structurally in our economy. Because not only is childcare and sort of women should stay home with the kid for the, the youngest years, it baked in and part of the, the foundational reasons to pay so bad. But then frankly, we've had, you know, white women who wanted to be professionals in this, that, and the other. And so women of color have ended up in the care profession completely disproportionately. I mean, it is just, it is it, and dominated by women of color arena. And these women are amazing and they can do anything and they have been overcoming adversity forever. And it's way past time that the system sort of come behind and figure out how to organize and support them, maybe like the K-12 system, certainly like other systems that are professionalized and valued for their contribution to society. We talk a lot about nursing being one of them. Yeah, well, yeah, no, well, you're, you're very dead on about all these issues and there's a lot of work ahead of us, right? And so I really want to thank you for your leadership on the school board, the, the good work you're doing in early childhood education um, at Growing Up New Mexico. This has been a great conversation. I, I'd love to do it again with you sometime. Pleasure. Always happy to talk right. to you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Kate.